Um, it's probably going to be a shortish class tonight, and it's also not well, won't be a very well attended class because it is a fast day. Um, and I guess a lot of people are not uh, in the mood to come to a class or they're busy uh, eating dinner or whatever it is. Okay, it was a fast day for the 17th of Tammuz, which is the day that all the problems with the destruction of the temple began. It's also the day on which the two tablets of stone were broken, Ishtabu Haluchot, the two tablets of stone as Moses came down the mountain and he saw with the tablets of stone and the Ten Commandments, he saw the Jewish people, the Israelites, worshipping the golden calf, and he threw them down and broke them. Um, let's not make a mistake, it was not in anger uh, that he broke them, but um, if the contract was never delivered, but it was torn in half before it got to the people to whom it were, for whom it was intended, then the contract is invalid, and therefore um, the first of the Ten Commandments is the prohibition against idolatry. And since they were worshiping idols, each one of them that was there and everybody who didn't warn them was really Chaya Misa could have been put to death, but um, that's why he broke the tablets. Anyway, that's the why we fast on the 17th of Tammuz and also because of the destruction, the beginning of the destruction of the, uh, the temples, first temple, second temple. So it's a fast day, a bit of a solemn day, and um, nevertheless, okay, um, the first thing I want to do is actually correct a possible misperception in a class that I gave uh, last week when I spoke about the concept of the Vekut. So right at the end of the class, um, I discussed the proper approach to dealing with, or to dealing with tragedies. Uh, God forbid, a person should never have them in their lives, but... Um, there was a possible mis misperception um, because it pro probably because of the way I said it and I didn't clarify. Um, when we were talking about um, relating to tragedies as a matter of divine providence, we're all in God's hands, and, um, and uh, that's just, you know, there's not much. We can, of course, we can change de our destinies, but um, my <clears throat> my attitude was, or the things that I said was, if it's all from God, then it's uh, and it's hard for us to stand His ways, and it's all for the good. That's what I said, and that is true. However, that is true for the person themselves. In other words, that's not what our attitude should be towards other people who are going through tragedy in their lives. In fact, there is a mitzvah, a commandment in the Torah to um, sympathize with those who are in a state of mourning because they lost a loved one. And much of the book of Eov, Job, in fact, the whole book of Eov, basically, Job, is all about that. His friends come to comfort him and they didn't prepare their words properly in advance. And um, even though everything that they said was true, um, it, is, it, was, it was said at the inappropriate time. They should have thought of how to adapt what they, were, what they wanted to say to the circumstance. That's number one. Number two, uh, the custom, the Jewish custom is that when you go to the house of a mourner, you do not speak other than comforting the mourner as you're about to leave, but you do not speak until he speaks. Or she speaks. In other words, you don't really have permission to say anything if the person doesn't want to communicate because it's a time of introspection. Um, a time of mourning is a time of introspection, and therefore it is probably an inappropriate uh, time to strike up conversations, especially, um, you know, jocular, joking, uh, lighthearted conversations that sometimes, <laughs> surprisingly, one does here at uh, such events. In any event, um, the sages uh, in, the, um, in the Talmud uh, tell us that anyone who sheds tears about the passing of a, uh, a person who's called a, a Adam Kosher, uh, Adam Kosher, um, an upright person, male or female, anyone who sheds tears uh, upon him is regarded, that's regarded as uh, 
as a forgiveness for all of that person's, the person who's shedding the tear for all of his transgressions. So if you shed a tear about a kosher person who passed, an upright person, that is a, um, it's a benefit even to you. And it shouldn't be done because of the benefit, but because um, you feel, you know, the pain of, uh, of the loss of the friendship of that person or the knowledge of that person or the, the, um, the presence, essentially, of that person. Um, okay. Um, another one of the sages in that same place is in the Talmud in Shabbat. 105b he says that any tears that a person person sheds about a kosher person an upright person who passed away god so to speak keeps those tears in a special storehouse um don't take it too literally um but um in other words those tears are precious to the almighty and not just to the person who you are trying to comfort. Um, and it goes even further that if a person does not mourn the passing of good people, then um, he's sort of opening the door for his own uh, demise, unfortunately, he or her. Um, again, it's not to be taken literally, it's just as if, as if as if he was opening the door for his own demise and uh, would be worthy thereof. In other words, when a good person passes away, we all have to um, do what we can to comfort the mourners. And uh, by the way, that might also uh, include, especially if they're orphans, young orphans, that might include taking upon oneself some financial responsibility to help the family out until such time as they can stand on their own two feet. Um, although Jewish funerals, at least traditional Jewish funerals, are not expensive um, things, nevertheless, the land of the living is an expensive place, and any help that uh, the family can, can get in such circumstances is obviously chesed shel emet. It is the kindness of truth. It's true kindness. It's true kindness. Similarly, attending the burial of a person during the middle of the pandemic uh, when there were people in New York dying left and right, one of my son-in-laws actually um, was involved in digging graves for those people who were passing away because the regular people who dug the graves or what it just simply didn't uh, couldn't keep up with her. they couldn't keep up with her. Maybe they themselves were sick or maybe they couldn't because of other reasons. I don't know. But uh, big mitzvah, big, uh, big thing. So in other words, basically, the attitude should be to my own tragedies, it's all in God's hands. To another person's tragedy, tra tragedies, you sympathize with them and you do whatever you can to comfort them and to help them um, in their hour of, uh, in their hour of sorrow. Okay, that was that question. Um, there are there were a few questions that came in. I'll just take them in the order that they came in. I should have actually given everybody more time to um, uh, to think of questions, but um, I didn't plan on making this a question and answer session until uh, later on in the afternoon. <laughs> in other words, I didn't have time to prepare, so. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> yes. All right. Um, I'm just muting everybody else. If you have a question, you can type it in the chat box. Um, and uh, let's look at uh, one of the questions that came into that that came in was, uh, what does raising da da'at out of tiferet? even really mean does it really have an effect now i'm not sure you read this so it could be that they're different um in different sources you have to know what the source is and uh what the discussion is around that particular thing but i'll just talk about it in general the idea of raising dart out of tiferet this actually relates very much to the topic that i just spoke about because tiferet is the sphira that is associated with compassion with rachamim with compassion. It's the middle sphira of the emotional sphirot. 
Um, let me just get a. Uh, Spirot. All right. Here we go. All right, let me share. Um, let me just share, share my screen. And um, here we go. Probably everybody knows that Tiferet is the middle sphera of the spherot, right? It's the middle sphera of the emotional spherot, rather, of the emotional spherot. These are the emotional spherot over here. Chesed, Vura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yisod. Chesed is, corresponds to in the soul. It's the concept of love or kindness. Vura is fear or, or harshness in the negative sense. Tiferet is compassion. Rachamim. And so on and so forth. Uh, if anyone is interested in the whole discussion, we can uh, discuss another time. But Tiferet basically is the in-between sphera of the six spherot. The idea of compassion. Dat is a sphera directly above Tiferet. So bringing Dat out of Tiferet, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure again of the context of that particular uh, question, that quote perhaps. But the idea, I suppose, of uh, out of Tiferet is to, to um, it could work two ways. To bring Dat out of Tiferet, to bring that out of Tiferet would be, I guess, to, um, uh, first of all, let me just explain what that corresponds to. That is the origin of the emotional qualities, but it's also the idea of that is the idea of, essentially it's the idea of Dvekut, it's the Sphira of Dvekut. It's the idea of cleaving to or attaching oneself to something, also called in Hebrew, if not Dvekut, which is sometimes regarded as a, as a uh, function of Chokhmah, but that is the idea of hit kashrut, of binding things together, right? So, uh, so bringing that out of Tiferet could work in two ways. It could be that that is brought out of Tiferet. In other words, out of compassion, one comes to a sense of understanding of, 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 uh, of intellectual understanding essentially of uh, of another person's uh, situation and that can therefore give rise to um to further um understanding of the person's situation and greater compassion that's one way in that it could possibly work that is also through connecting to again that is connection through connecting to a person's situation one is able to arouse compassion. So that's from above to below. That's above to below. Um, okay. Um, there are more connections than that, but um, let's just put it in a general context the idea of that is much more, it's much closer to emotional arousal than the Svirot of Chokhmah and Bina. Although Bina is the, called the mother, the mother of the children, in other words, the mother of all the emotional qualities. Why? Because Bina is understanding and the way you understand something, or let's put it in modern terminology, the mindset, according to a person's mindset, is going to be their emotional arousal, the emotional response. I think we discussed this last week as well in Vekut. Um, but even though Bina is directly the mother, so to speak, of the, of the emotions, it is that that is sort of, let's call it the focus group, right? That is the focus sphera, the sphera that will focus... Um, that will focus on 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 uh, on everyone and everything and every situation. So that is the concept of focus, and out of that focus can come proper compassion. Similarly, out of compassion can come a, a more intense focus on the depth of that person's issue. Um, just interestingly enough, one of the one of the things that's very important for us to understand um, in terms of um, 
let's call it Kabbalistic psychology, is the ability, when we're talking about empathy, empathy is generally an emotional quality. Right? It's, an, it's an emotional quality. You empathize emotionally with a person. In other words, people generally regard empathy as sympathy. Kabbalah regards empathy as, at least partly, if not more completely, as, um, as an intellectual thing, like understanding the person's situation. So, in other words, sympathizing, sympathizing in mindset with that particular person's mind, mindset, trying to get into and understand that person's uh, mindset. So that would be the concept of uh, Dart. And it's also the connection between intellect and, uh, and emotions. Okay, uh, let me address some other questions here. Um, I suppose I should stop sharing. <laughs> Keep people's questions private. Okay, well, their identities. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, um, that is the concept of dot out of Tiferet. Okay, there was another question um, that. Let me just see one second. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that um, is only once that a person dies. Um, well, I suppose that the the idea is that you only die once in any particular life. Um, there is a verse that talks about dying a thousand deaths. I think it's in Kohelet in Ecclesiastes, if I'm not mistaken. But dying a thousand deaths, um, one could die a little bit inside as well. You could die emotionally, you could die, a person can die um, um, intellectually um, as well. And um, I suppose the question really essentially has to do more with reincarnation. If the soul uh, lives on, well, let's let's step back, step back for a minute. It's only the body that dies. The soul does not die. Now, there's different levels of soul, and um, it is the higher levels of soul that do not die. Um, the nefesh, which is the conscious awareness, that passes away with the passing of the body. Um, in other words, the awareness of the body, the physical awareness of the body, emotional awareness... Uh, also passes away after some time it it it, it uh, moves up into a higher sort of order uh, into the person's uh, learning in other words the level of ruach moves up to the level of neshama essentially but from there upwards from neshama and on uh, there is no death per se in other words even though it might the the neshama level might experience death whereas chaya and yechidu do not chaya actually means life does not experience experience death per se, and neither Yechida for sure doesn't because it's part of God doesn't experience uh, experience death at all. Um, so, when we talk about the concept of death, that is only really in the lower uh, in the lower regions, the lower levels of the soul. Now, when a person comes back to life, the person the the purpose of reincarnation uh, in in Jewish thought. Uh, and you will find in some Jewish thought, thought that they discount the concept of reincarnation altogether. That is because they never learned Kabbalah. Uh, reincarnation is only really discussed in Kabbalah. It's called, called Gilgul Hanashamot, uh, the recycling, I suppose, of souls. And the whole purpose of the recycling of souls is to give a person another chance, to give them a chance to rectify that which they did not rectify previously. Therefore, it, could, it might turn out that the... Um, the um, um, the life of a person in this world may be, you know, a tough life. And probably the reason for it is because there's some rectification that needs to be done. And um, as to what rectification it is, this needs some research uh, for each individual, what that particular rectif rectification might be. And it's not always easy to discern what it is. Uh, there were certain Kabbalists like uh, the Arizal, for example, uh, Baal Shem Tov, that they could just look at your forehead and they could tell you exactly 
what reincarnations you've been through before and what your tikkun would be in this life, what tikkun you needed to do. Okay. So, um, uh, as far as reincarnation is concerned, one of the questions was, is it possible for a person to return as a tree or an animal or an inanimate object? And the answer is yes, it is possible. It is not desirable by any means. Uh, usually it's the, that, that's actually the uh, form, that's, the, that's actually a punishment uh, for that particular soul. And uh, there are several stories from the Baal Shem Tov and from the Arizal um, about um, souls that were incarnated in animals uh, and even in inanimate objects that had to be rectified. And the Baal Shem Tov, the Arizal, did those rectifications. Um, just by the way, any time that you use a an inanimate object or even... Um, even an animate object, even a living creature, but you use it for a mitzvah, it could be part of the rectification of a soul or the aspect of a soul, a spark from a soul that's embedded in that particular um, that particular object or creature and so on. Um, yeah, there are a lot of stories about uh, reincarnations that... Um, um, so I don't know. <laughs> make your hair stand on end. <laughs> okay. Um, Chaim Vitam was listed as a Gilgul. The truth is that in our days, most souls are Gilgulim. Most souls are not new souls. Let me explain what a Gilgul is. Essentially, all souls were content. Well, let me let me rephrase that. All souls that would la later be reincarnated were already contained in Adam right? There are a few souls that were only incarnated once and that they achieved their rectification and they never had to come back again. But the, probably the majority of souls of people alive today are reincarnated souls that need to do some tikkun and that's why they come back. That's why they're alive in this world. All were part of Adam originally. However, there were some souls that were not part of Adam. What were those souls? So there were two sets of them. Two sets, that's called Neshamot Harashot, new souls. One set, uh, one set of souls was part of Adam, but fled from him just before he did the sin, before he ate from the tree of, uh, of knowledge of good and evil. They fled from him. And those souls, when they come back into reincarnation, are called Neshamot Harashot. They're called new souls. But there's another type of new soul, a soul that was never before in creation was never before, it wasn't even part of Adam. And there are some very rare souls that are like that. Um, there are indications that the, um, the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, was one such soul. He, it's known that he was a new soul, but it's not known, at least not to me, which type of new soul he was. It hinted at that he was the type of new soul that was, it wasn't even part of Adam to start off with, which is why even from the age of an extremely young age, he was a very, very gifted uh, mind. He could remember everything, and he, uh, he was a real, <laughs> he, was, he was a soul that was uh, a pure soul. Um, and there have been others uh, through uh, throughout history. Um, okay. Uh, finally, a third question from this person, and then I'll have to go on to other questions. Uh, what type of mitzvot commandments, and how many do keep you do you keep do keep you out of Gehenna? Gehenna is purgatory, or uh, what they call hell, or the abyss after the initial 12 months in the dryer and the washing machine. <laughs> right. Uh, the washing machine and dryer is a, um, a soul is only in a state of, well, the, the, the majority of souls are only in a state of purgatory of Gehenna, of, uh, of hell, you want to call it that, for a period of 12 months or less, uh, where they get, they go through a dry cleaning process, as, uh, as he called it, uh, you know, dry cleaning. Um, but what, kind of mitzvot keep you out of there in the first place is what 
really the question should be. And that is you do whatever you can in terms of, uh, of the commandments that you're obligated in. If a person is Jewish, he's obligated in, um, in 613 commandments, but many of them we can't practice today because they have to do with the temple. So you do the best you can. You, you, know, you keep the Sabbath, very important one. Um, obviously, uh, murder, theft, lying, and so on and so forth are all things that we have to be careful about. Keeping Passover, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, all the uh, all the mitzvot. Let's not go through the whole list here, but um, keeping all the mitzvot to the best of your ability is one sure way to avoid most of the problems. And studying Torah for sure can keep a person out of uh, you know out of, out of the fires of hell, so to speak. Right? Um, Torah study is very important in that uh, in that regard. In fact, uh, of paramount importance. Torah study, prayer, and kindness to others. Um, included in kindness to others is not speaking badly about others. I hope that uh, we'll. I hope that we'll meet in uh, in heaven and not <laughs> in Ghanaid in the Garden of Eden and not in the other place. Okay. Um, okay. Now, a question that. Um, Um, according to the Ramchal, or Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lusato, who was one of the Italian Kabbalists, very, uh, very gifted Kabbalist as well. Uh, so he said, the Kudin comes from the Breshit 3110 with the streaked and speckled sheep. Yes. Uh, did Jacob get a glimpse of the world of Adam Kadmon? Um, did Jacob get a glimpse of the world of Adam Kadmon? There are certain aspects of Adam Kadmon. Now, let me just explain to everybody. There are five worlds, as I'm sure everybody is familiar with. The lowest of the worlds are called Asiya, next Yetzira, then Bria, then Atsilut, and then there's a general world that contains all of the world. It's, a, it's an all-encompassing world, so to speak, called Adam Kadmon. Now, Adam Kadmon exists after the Tzimtzum, after the big uh, break between the Orain Sof, the infinite divine light, and creation, Adam, Ka Adam Kadmon, is the first step in creation, essentially. After the Tzimtzum comes the Kav, and the Kav is, uh, is Nisagal, the Chos of Nisagal, it goes around in, in a circular form, so to speak, in other words, in, in a makif, in a transcendent uh, manner, and that's how the world of Adam Kadmon is created. Now, in Adam Kadmon itself, there are various different levels, right? There are various different levels, which are, are depicted as... Um, described as, but don't make this mistake, that they actually are there. The eyes, ears, nose, and mouth of Adam Kadmon, right? The, and also the karkafta, the, uh, the, um, the head, the top of the head, the skull of Adam Kadmon. Now, the karkafta is something that we don't discuss at all, the karkafta of Adam Kadmon. What is called the karkafta, obviously, we're not talking about a physical figure here. We're only talking about, about it by way of analogy from a human being. So the karkafta, that level, we don't really speak about very much. Then there are other levels that come out of, or that, that, that are subsets, so to speak, of Adam Kadmon. There's the light of the eyes, the light of the ears, and the light of the nose, and the light of the mouth. And that comes out of the mouth. Again, these are only just um, human terminology applied to Adam Kadmon in order to be able to understand there are no ears, eyes, nose, mouth, etc. over there. Yeah, we're talking about different levels of lights, of divine lights. Okay, so now, uh, the level of Nikudim, the level of Nikudim is the light that comes out of the eyes. That's called, that's called Nikudim. And that is where the uh, break took place. The, the light of Nikudim is where the break, the, the Shvirat Kelim of the world of Tohu came from. The... Um, the world of Tohu was designed uh, to shatter and fall apart into creation in order to be re re uh, reconstructed into the world of Tikkun, and that was left for us to do. So it was done deliberately like this, but the world of, uh, of, of Nikodim corresponds to the speckled sheep. When Jacob... Um, um, in Jacob's dream... 
he saw various sheep, speckled sheep and, and, uh, and um, striped sheep and so on and so forth. And these corresponded to the various worlds. Did he see the actual worlds? He saw them as manifest in his dream. He saw them manifested symbolically. And uh, he then knew uh, what to actually do with them. Um, and that's when he planted sticks in the troughs and he, he, he cut stripes in the sticks. He peeled off the bark in various places and he made the sheep come out in a certain way. In other words, what he was doing was practical Kabbalah. He was, he was, he was bringing the world of Akudim, the world of Akudim, which is a higher world than Nikudim, uh, the world of Akudim uh, into reality. Um, and he was, he, was, he was actually, what he was doing was removing the spiritual wealth that Laban, Laban, his father-in-law, Lavan, Lavan had captured and was not, um, it didn't belong to him. It wasn't his place to capture those sparks. So he removed those sparks by, by making the sheep come out in a certain way, like speckled, spotted, and so on and so forth. And uh, that was, in, within those sheep was the... Um, the spark that he wanted to clarify and disencumber, as it's called, take away from the broken shards of the world of Tohu, from the world of Lavan, of Laban, and bring it back to the world of holiness. And that's what he did, and that's why he sacrificed some of, some of, uh, some of the sheep. The sacrificial aspect was to elevate the entire herd of, uh, or flock of sheep, and so on. Okay. That was that question. Um, let's see now. There, I don't know if there were other questions that came in. No, there are no questions that came into email, so I'll close that. And um, okay, let's look at the rest of them. Um, by the way, the system of uh, of uh, the Ramchal is not the system of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov has a different uh, different system of um, of Kabbalah, a somewhat different system. I mean, all of them are more or less the same, but there there are some differences in terms of the uh, Timtum and various other things. Okay. Um, Okay, Shane, you, that's a good question. Shane asks how the regular rituals of Judaism actually help you attach yourself to, to God. Well, number one, they're reminders. Number two, they occur usually at certain times. And therefore, if you dedicate a certain amount of time during the day to do these things, now it's not just repeating sentences by rote. Unfortunately, we all, we all do that all of the time. But it's a time really of hitbon and nut. It's time of meditation. It's a time you have to sit down and you have to think before you... Um, before you, uh, before you pray, the prayer should be heartfelt. That should come from the heart, and uh, the, the words of prayer are there to, once you, you they, they flow easily in your mouth, and you don't have to think about the words, but you can think about the concepts behind the words, the ideas. In other words, they lead your um, consciousness in a certain direction. Prayers, for example, same thing with mitzvot. And therefore, cleaving is part of the mitzvah. Now, interestingly enough, if a person did the cleaving without actually fulfilling the commandment, without doing the mitzvah, he didn't actually do anything. Um, cleaving is all very well, but that does not rectify the world in which we are placed in order to rectify it. In order to rectify it. So, um, the, um, the idea, therefore, is um, to combine both things. Now, there were amongst the great um, Hasidim in particular, Hasidim are those of the Hasidic persuasion who follow um, the Baal Shem Tov's manner of, you know, the Baal Shem Tov's approach to uh, divine worship. So he um, instituted, uh, he was, he was very well known for his Dvekut, and he instituted certain customs and so on and so forth that emphasized that aspect of things. So there were amongst some of his followers who themselves became rebbers, they became very high and uh, you know, lofty uh, figures in, in the Hasidic world uh, who would 
pray, not for the hour or so that's uh, required a day, but uh, for hours on end, um, to the extent that uh, there's, for example, a story with Rabbi Shnezam and Liadi. He started praying very early in the morning from uh, before Nates, from dawn. Nates is uh, sun, sunrise, from dawn. He started his prayers at dawn, and he continued them th right through, they continued right throughout the day until it was so late that he quickly he had to first pray the afternoon prayer and then uh, quickly wash for his Sabbath meal because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to eat the Sabbath meal. <laughs> so he prayed the whole day, basically. You're talking about, uh, you know, on a summer's day, that could be uh, 14 hours, maybe, maybe longer. 14, 15 hours. Now, no one's suggesting that uh, that we all do that today. I don't think we have the minds and the minds to be able to do that. Um, some people do, but it's um, in the world in which we live, it's not necessarily the only approach. In any event, um, the um, the idea of uh, of the rituals of Judaism are there to the outer form of the ritual is the outer attachment, the attachment to the body, the focusing of the mind. But then the much greater thing is once the mind is focused, the body is focused, the mind is focused, one has to focus the inner mind and the heart and the soul essentially on, uh, on the thing. And that uh, has to do um, a lot with um, um, sort of improving one's approach. Divinity in the dust. Can I explain divinity in the dust? Divinity in the dust, again, I'm not sure of the context of this, but it says that divinity has been brought down to the dust. This basically is usually associated with the destruction of the temple, which is basically ground into dust by the Romans. Uh, prior, prior to that, by Nebuchadnezzar, but primarily the Romans. Uh, so divinity in the dust basically means, uh, King David also speaks about it in Psalms, about raising up divinity from the dust. In other words, um, as an idiom, as an idiomatic term, it simply means raising divinity from its lowest possible, um, from the lowest possible levels to higher levels. But there is somewhat of a secret in this as well, that the power of, much of the power of, much of divine power is actually found in the earth. The earth is um, the sphera of Malchut, symbolized by the sphere of Malchut, and Malchut contains within it all of the other spherot. They all contain all the spherot, but Malchut is being the closest to us, is the one that's easiest to, um, to access. So King David says that raising up divinity is through being like the dust. Let my soul be as dust to everybody, and that raises up the divinity within the person. Humility raises up divinity. Arrogance crushes it. Arrogance is what puts it in the, um, in the dirt. <laughs> Humility raises it from the dirt, so to speak, from the dust. Okay. Uh, no, no, no need to apologize. That's um, out of the upper third security, it's like something out of perception. You mentioned attachment. Um, All right, I will skip some of that question because it's a little complicated. Uh, what was the general pl plan of God with reincarnation? And why are we developing? Well, um, God created the, the world in order for man to become a partner in creation. Um, the original one of the one of the one of the early verses in Genesis reads, "Asher bara Elohim la asot," and we also say in Kiddush on Friday night that God created to do, or God created to rectify, letaken, to rectify. God created, in other words, He created a certain world for us to become partners in creation. How do we become partners in creation? By raising up the world from its. Um, natural born status to a state of holiness and uh, why did god want that we don't really know um the midrash and this is discussed actually at length in many hasidic discourses 
and the Bhatti Lagani discourse is the one that we discussed, in fact, one of the ones that we learned. Um, but the basic idea is that we can't tap into, we can't access God's desire, just as we, even a person's will, it's impossible to, uh, to, to, uh, to really tap into another person's will because it's a transcendent power of the soul. How much more so that which transcends the will, the aspect of delight, uh, which corresponds in the Svirot or in the Pratsufim to, to Atik Yomin, to Atik. To Atik, the delight of the soul, the delight of the soul in God. Why is it that God delights in the soul doing certain things within a body in this world? We don't know. <laughs> Nitava, that's what he wanted. <laughs> we don't know. We do know what he wanted, but why he wanted it, that's not for us to know. Uh, is it possible that we will know at some point in time? Yes, absolutely, it's possible. Um, in the future. Okay. Is it possible for a gear to rise up from a new soul? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, Yael. I don't know. I could look it up. I have not come across anything that would tell me yes. But it's worth looking up. Um, is the gear here to rectify the sins of his soul versus of the Jewish nation? Um, It's to rectify his soul primarily, um, and all souls essentially stem from Adam. Also, souls of, of Jewish people and souls of non-Jewish people. It's only that uh, certain souls decided at the time that the Torah was given, uh, certain souls were willing to um, become part of that experience and therefore have a certain path. They chose... Um, I've quoted this many, many times, <laughs> and uh, I hope you don't mind my quoting it again. It's just very, uh, very good um, uh, uh, quotation from Oscar Wilde, who himself was a wild person and a very, very strange person in many ways, but he had a very sharp sense of humor, and uh, he was highly intelligent. Anyway, what he said was this, how odd of God to choose the Jews. And then he continues and he says, not so odd, the Jews chose God. In other words, the Jews regard themselves as a, cho as a chosen na nation only because we chose God, we chose, right? So, so therefore, uh, Oscar Wilde had, yeah, I think he was onto something. How odd of God to choose the Jews, not so odd, the, the Jews chose God. Now, does it mean that anybody else, therefore, is not in a position to choose God? Of course not, right? In any religion and in any, um, any spiritual path, um, one can connect and one can connect to God. We connect in a certain way and we have a certain destiny and a certain, uh, a certain path that is not for everybody. Uh, anybody can become Jewish. They can become a ger, a, a convert if they want to. And some of them, the most famous rabbis of all time actually were converts starting with, um, well, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, and 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 uh, Moses' wife, Zipporah, were converts. They were converts. They were even earlier converts than that. That said, uh, the uh, the uh, the many followers of Abraham, the souls that they made in Haran, in Haran, the place called Haran, that uh, the Zohar says that these were the souls of converts. They, they were people that converted to the, to, to the religion, to the belief of Abraham. He started it, so anyone who joined him was a, was a convert, except his own children, children and descendants. So um, the convert, the soul of the convert, um, is a soul that became somehow detached from, um, from its people and is returning. Because the soul of a convert is initially a Jewish soul. It was a soul that was at Mount Sinai, uh, but became detached for some reason or another. Um, and that is why the expression that is used in the sages is ger shinit gayer, a convert who converted. Why don't you just say a person converted? No, a convert who converted because he already had the soul of a convert. In other words, his soul was a Jewish soul that comes back to uh, Judaism. Uh, yeah, it's got... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it goes a little bit too deep, yeah. Um, the new time. All 
right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jack Valley Dream saw the spectrum called Chief and Prudim was, yeah, with the, with the uh, Akudim, Nikudim, and Brudim with the three types of sheep, yes. Um, what role do, do non-Jews play? Go, I mean, non-Jews, let's call them uh, non-Jewish people. Uh, it's more um, appropriate. Do they play in the over, uh, overarching divine machination, divine plan, I would say? Um, the divine plan. A variety of answers, other possibilities. Okay, let's just put things in perspective. God created everything that he wanted to create and didn't create anything that he didn't want to create. Everything that was created, he wanted for some purpose or another. So let's put to rest the, the idea that there's anything that does not have a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything that was created, whether you're talking about from a rock to a human being, within human beings, from... And a person, who worships, a person who worships idols to the most holy person you can imagine, to, uh, to, to the Kohen God or the high priest who served in the temple. All of them are created in a certain way and for a certain purpose. The Jewish people have their purpose in the world. They've been given uh, um, a certain destiny and a certain purpose to fulfill. Non-Jews have also been given a certain purpose. Is it the same purpose as, as Jews? No, they can acquire the purpose of Jews by converting, but do not have to. There's no obligation anywhere in the Torah for a person to convert to Judaism. A person can be a good person by following the seven Noahide laws, um, the seven Noahide laws, and following them scrupulously leads a person to become a Tzadik umot haolam, a tzaddik of the nations of the world, a righteous person of the nations of the world, who in who goes to the Garden of Eden, his soul inherits uh, um, um, paradise, and so on and so forth. Um, more specifically, well, it depends on which particular person um, we're talking about and what particular challenges they follow. But since I see that there's 17 new questions down below. I hope that answers it uh, sort of very briefly. If you want to go into it more, I can perhaps approach it one day in a class if there's any interest in it. Um, uh, man after man was born in her in... Um, um, uh, Yael, is this Yael's question? Yeah, Yael... Um, I don't want to answer without looking at the commentaries on the verse because um, I may make a I may make an error. I'd rather not do that. Um, if you want, I can turn you to certain, point you to some commentaries and uh, or I can answer you in an email or just drop me an email about that and um, and uh, reiterate your question. Perhaps uh, I can discuss it that way. Um, Okay, I'm not sure what that question was about. Are there other planets that is Earth that God is doing exactly the same, same thing simultaneously? Earth does have a, in the Torah, Earth has a very special uh, function. Are there other planets where maybe there are other living creatures? I don't know. There's certainly living creatures in, uh, you know, in the angelic realms. Uh, are there creatures on other planets? Uh, could be, uh, who knows? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I would tend to say probably not at least not intelligent. Um, but there's plenty of unintelligent people on our planet too. <laughs> okay. Avram was the first guy. Yeah, that is true. Uh, I didn't mean the Milky Way, but those areas out there beyond our Milky Way, uh, maybe. Could be. I mean, it's a vast, 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 vast universe, so it's certainly possible. Um, okay, you are welcome. Uh, River Sum 87. Yes, I, I know. Um, are we the best Q&A group you've got, you've worked with? <laughs> uh, actually, some of the questions are very interesting, yes. Um, but I don't know what everybody else thought. Maybe I got sort of too in the weeds with some of the answers, but uh, the questions were certainly good. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm not looking for compliments, but, but I do appreciate them when they come from time to time. <laughs> Okay, um, folks, I think I'm going to have to call it a day here because the fast in my neck of the woods is coming to an end in about uh, five minutes or so. 
uh, actually a little bit longer than that, eight minutes or so. And, um, and hopefully um, we will not have to fast ever again because we will have entered the messianic era with the Bios Mashiach Tzidkenu, the coming of, uh, of uh, Mashiach, and uh, all the troubles of the world will be over, and we might not even have to vote. <laughs> okay, may it come so swiftly in our times, right, okay. All the best, everybody, um, and I will post the Q&A as usual on YouTube uh, once it has, um, once it has, um, gone through the process of uh, whatever it's called. All right. Thanks and good night.